Really great little saints. Well, tonight, if you have your Bible, turn with me to the book of Mark again. Mark chapter 3, we want to begin reading with verse 13. Mark chapter 3, beginning with verse 13. And he goeth up into a mountain, and called unto him whom he would, and they came unto him. <clears throat> and he ordained the twelve that they should be with him, and that he might send them forth to preach, and to have power to heal sickness, cast out devils. And Simon he surnamed Peter, and James the son of Zebedee, and John the brother of James, he surnamed them Borgargi, Boan Argis, which is the son of thunder. Sounds good, but And Andrew and Philip and Bartholomew and Matthew and Thomas and James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, and Simon the Canaanite. And Judas as carried, which also betrayed him, they went into a house. And the multitude cometh together again, so that they could not so much as eat bread, and when his friends heard of it, they went out to lay hold of him, for they said, He is beside himself. And the scribes which came down from Jerusalem said, He hath Beelzebub, by the prince of devils, he casteth out devils. And he called them unto him, and said unto them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? And if a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house be divided against itself, the house cannot stand. And if Satan rise up against himself and be divided, he cannot stand but hath an end. No man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he will first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house. Verily I say unto you, all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men and blasphemies, wherewithsoever they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Spirit hath no, never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. Because they said he hath an unclean spirit, there came then his brethren, and his mother, and standing with us, sent unto him, calling him. And the multitude said about him, and they said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brother without seek for thee. And he answered them, saying, Who is my mother or my brother? And he looked around about them, and said, that which said about him, and said, Behold, my mother, my brother, for whosoever shall do the will of God, the same is my brother, my sister, and my mother. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for this day. I thank you, Lord God, for the many, many wonderful blessings that you poured out upon us as individuals and the way that you've blessed us as a church. We have so many things to be thankful for. We live in a wonderful country. Oh, I know there's a lot that's not right back, but there are a lot that is. And we want to thank you for that. We want to thank you for the churches that are gathered together tonight, wherever they might be, preaching, proclaiming the word of God, singing the old hymns and praising you with all their hearts and souls. And we thank you, Lord God, for our missionaries who are not only here in uh, in the United States of America, but around the world who are proclaiming the gospel, who are telling people about the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, too, that you have promised us that you'll always be with us, you'll watch over us, you'll take care of us, and you've made us a wonderful promise that one day you're coming back. And when you do, We'll call it up to be with you in the air, and what a glorious, glorious time that will be. Heavenly Father, tonight, I pray if there's one here who has never accepted you as their personal Savior, 
that tonight they would open up their hearts and invite the Lord Jesus Christ to come in. I pray too, Lord God, that if there are Christians here tonight who are out of fellowship with you, who need to really confess their sins and get back on the straight and narrow, I pray that, pray that they would do that. Do it quickly because if we don't, it just continues to fester and will cause us all kind of problems down the way. <clears throat> so Lord God, help us now to be faithful unto you, to serve you, and do the very best that we can possibly do. We're in a new year, 2014, so help us to live it in a way that would truly bring honor and glory to your name. For it is in your name that we pray and ask these things, and we give you all praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, <clears throat> If Jesus had been a celebrity, remember he's a servant. He came to serve, uh, not for someone to serve him. But if he had been a celebrity and not a servant, he would have catered to these crowds that were following him. Crowds of people were following him. And he would have done everything that he could do to try to please them. Instead of that, though, he withdrew and began to minister to his disciples, these uh, uh, that he had called, his 12 apostles, really, to, to follow him and serve him. Jesus had to teach them. He had to teach them about the crowns. He had to teach them about the kingdom of God. He had to teach them about the things that God wanted them to know and to understand. In so, dis in so doing that, first of all, you notice he found a new nation, and a new family. He started with the 12 and built them into a mighty nation. Israel was chosen to bring the Messiah into the world through him all, and through him, through the Messiah, all the nations of the world might be blessed. So, <clears throat> by the way, Jesus spent all night in prayer before he called these men. Just, I might just say this to you. A church, any church, anywhere, should spend much, much time in prayer before selecting its leaders. Right. You know, many times, I, you know, many times a church will call somebody to be a preacher of the church. It's some old boy they knew somewhere or something. And they do not spend any time in prayer doing that. You want to select deacons or anyone to teach or whatever it might be spend a lot of time in prayer before you select the leader. Jesus had three purposes here in mind and calling them. First of all, he wanted to train them. Now we, I don't know how many of you here tonight remember when we used to have training union. It was called church training later and then finally, you know, it was done away with. But it was a time of training when you could train people, you know. It was done on a Sunday night before the Sunday evening service. And, uh, you know, you were assigned a part. And you had to get up and give it. And out of that come teachers and workers and people who were willing to and dedicate themselves to doing something for the Lord. I think we still need that kind of a program. We ought to probably initiated here, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. But, you know, he wanted to train those disciples. He didn't just pick them and then say, okay, I'm going to let you go. You do your own things. No, he trained them. He set the example for them. And that's what we need to do. The second thing he did, he, he sent them out. He sent them out to witness. Now, I don't know when the... Uh, I think that's, if you're in business, I think that's called OJT. What is it? OJT is on the job training, right? So that's what he was doing. They were on the job, and he was training them on the job to do the things that he had called them to do. You know, they were to preach the good news and, and tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And the only way they could do that was be by the example he had set, and they were willing to do this. Now, the third thing you do, he give them authority. He didn't just say, go out on your own and do the best that you could possibly do. He gave them authority. He gave them authority to heal, authority to cast out demons, and they would be able to continue his work. After he, he did this, you know, so that they could continue his work after he went back to heaven, went back, returned back to the Father. They would still be able to do what he had called them to do. And not only that, but he, they would be able to train others as well. Now, this is a wonderful thing. You know, the early church, they held to this. And they trained the disciples to go out. And the disciples would train other disciples. And he just he continued on and still continues on today. Because, you know, churches today train their people to do uh, to go, to witness, to serve, and all of those things. Now, he, he, let me just, he, you want to get this straight, though. Now, Jesus had many disciples, but he only had 12 apostles. Uh, a disciple is one who uh, learns by doing. An apostle is one who is sent, who is sent out on an official service. They're given a commission. He ordained them to go out, didn't he? So, and by the way, the names of these uh, 12 are always arranged in pairs. I don't know whether you noticed that or not, but always are. Peter and Andrew, always together. James and John together. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and uh, Matthew. James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus. Simon, the Zealot, and Judas. Remember, they were sent out two by two. Two of them, he changed their names. Simon, he changed his name to Peter. And Levi, he changed his name to Matthew. James and John, by the way, this is interesting. James and John were called the sons of thunder. Now, I'll tell you something. I had a hard time with that years ago because of all the people in the Bible, who seems to just, ah, love just seems to pour out of it, is who? The Apostle John. He writes about love, loving one another, love the Lord. All of these say, how in the world could John have been known as a son of, son of thunder? I don't know. I got a feeling he changed a lot along the way, don't you? I think the good Lord really changed him. But I think it's also encouraging here to see that the Lord, <clears throat> what the Lord did with this diverse group of, of men. He took those 12 men, of course, one of them, you know, uh, uh, turned against him. But he took this group of men and he did some tremendous things with those, those individuals. I think that just simply shows that there's hope for us. There's hope that we too can be changed, that we too can become what God would have us to be, that we too can do the work of the Lord wherever we're put, because he is with us and he will do it. Now, I don't know about you, but in my study of Scripture, I always get, I guess I get off on some things, but sometimes... Uh, I, I just think it's interesting, you know, that si, Simon the Zealot. Now, you know what the Zealots were? Boy, they hated Rome. They, their main number one purpose was to overthrow the Roman government. Now, I don't know about you, but I wonder what he thought when Jesus called Matthew this tax collector who worked for Rome. I bet he said, what are you doing? What are you calling that guy for? Don't you understand who he is? He works for the Roman government. He might not have said that. I mean. <laughs> but anyway, I bet it was interesting. I bet, you know, you know, Levi, he was an employee of Rome. 
The Zealots are a group of Jewish extremists. They, they wanted nothing whatsoever to do with Rome. They wanted to overthrow Rome. I don't know about you, but something just tells me that when these 12 got together, Jesus probably had a hard time keeping them, you know, quieted down. Twelve men, fishermen, all of these, you know, I bet they had a lot to say. That was interesting, at least, to have known what, the, you know, what they did and how they come together to form a, a union uh, like they did. Now, it, he establishes this the, from these who are willing to go and be sent out to establish a new family and eventually a new nation. Then in verses uh, 21 through 35, we have something different here. He establishes a new name. First of all, he establishes a new family, establishes a new nation. And now here, he establishes a new name. Now, our Lord's friends were sure Jesus was confused. They knew that he needed some help. They thought he wasn't leading a normal life. You know, uh, so his friends, they, they came to Capernaum and to take charge of him. They wanted to, you know, make sure that he wasn't really, gone, hadn't gone astray or something or another. And then his mother and brothers traveled 31 miles to plead with him to come home. They must have thought, you know, he'd gone off the deep end somehow or another. They wanted to come home, get some rest. By the way, this is the place of work where Mary, Mary is mentioned here, not her name, but the mother of Jesus, her name was Mary. She's mentioned here. And her venture at this point in time was a colossal failure. She could not get Jesus to come home or even to listen to her. Now history, history reveals that God's servants are misjudged by their contemporaries and usually they misunderstood by their families. Dwight L. Moody, Dwight L. Moody, the great preacher, Methodist preacher, you know what they called him in Chicago? In Chicago, they called him Crazy Moody. Crazy, he's lost his mind. He's went off the deep end. Of course, in Chicago, they might call him. But, you know, but they thought, yeah, this, this guy, who turned out, you know, to be really, his family at one time turned against him. Wondering why it is that you're doing what you're doing. Billy Sunday. You remember Billy Sunday, don't you, in the Sawdust Trail? Well, people thought he was crazy. But you know what he was doing? He was winning lost people to the Lord Jesus Christ. Up in the Kentucky Hills and the West Virginia Hills and, uh, well, in the hills. <laughs> in the mountains, young men couldn't read or write. Would have someone read the Bible hill, and they'd go out in those mountains and those hollers and those hills, and they'd proclaim what they knew about the Lord Jesus Christ. And God did a wonderful, marvelous thing through these people. People came and give their hearts and their souls to the Lord Jesus Christ. But you know, there were those people who said, those, those guys are crazy. They don't have any learning. They have no knowledge. They haven't been to college. They haven't been to seminary. They don't know what's going on. What they knew was that they loved the Lord Jesus Christ and Christ was leading them and directing them. You see, that was what is so important. <laughs> now, Jesus with his family uh, you know, he was not being rude to his family. Uh, when he revived, when he just simply remained in the house and refused to see him. He knew, he knew that their motive was right, but their purpose was all wrong, you see. 
Here, here's the thing about it. If Jesus had yielded to his family at this point, he would have played right into the hands of the opposition. The religious leaders would have said, well, yeah, he agrees with his family. So sure, he needs help. His family says he needs help. So if he goes along with them, then they're going to say, yeah, look at that. If his family thinks he needs help, then, well, he surely does need it. But you know what Jesus does? Isn't this wonderful? Notice what he does. Instead, instead of giving in, he used this crisis to teach him a lesson. He did that many, many times in the Word of God. You know, notice he says the family, his family, his family, is made up of all who do the will of God. Do you know something? You're, you're saved. Did you know that you're a part of the family of God? Amen. Yeah. And I am so thank I am so glad that I'm a part of the family of God. Amen. You know. That's what Jesus is trying to get across to him. Listen. You're a part. You're a part of God's family. You know, family is made up of all those who do the will of God. Of course, at this time, our Lord's half-brothers were not believers. But he's, not, he's not suggesting here. He's not, he's not suggesting that, uh, that believers ignore their families. That's not what he's doing. He's not saying ignore your family or abandon your family uh, in order to serve God, but that they would put God above everything else in their lives. You see, this is a problem. Many people, they'll say, yeah, and you know, there's other verses of Scripture deal with this. They'll say, yeah, I'm going to follow God, but I'll tell you why. My family comes before God. My sisters, my brothers, even my mother, my father, they come before God. Now that's that's really hard, you know, for some people to get get a hold of and get their grip on. Uh, but you know, here here's the thing about it. The way I look at it, I don't know, you may have a different take on, but we're to love the Lord God with all of our hearts and our minds and our soul. And when you love God that way, He'll take care of your family. Amen. Amen. I don't know why it is that so many people get caught up, you know, with their family and they stop serving God. Oh, I, I can't do it. I gotta take care of this, I gotta do that. Oh. No, Jesus said your family is important, there's no doubt about that, but God comes first. And we need to see that. You should never listen. I say you, we. We should never, never, never permit our dearest loved ones to influence us away from the will of God. <clears throat> but many times, we know that that takes place. Now this must have been extremely hard. If you understand the, the Jewish family in that day and time, the Jewish family was in poor, it was number one. It was important in that society, you see. Now, you, you can just imagine, can't you, how the radical words of Christ must have sounded to those people who heard this. They must have thought, my, my, he can't mean that. By the way, you know, there's a verse of Scripture says that if you, those people... I shared with you in the beginning, my wife's brother just passed away. And she's upset because she can't go. No, that's understandable. 
That's understandable. But you see, that doesn't mean that you stop doing the will of God. What is the will of God for your life? This is 2014, the first week of it. Have you sat down and just scratched out on a piece of paper what God's will for your life is for this year? I don't guess any of you have. You should. You really should. What is it that you want to what is it you want to accomplish for the Lord this year? <coughs> what is it you think He wants you to do with your life this year? Oh, just rock along. Get the old rocking chair and rock by the fireplace. Huh. My neighbors were all dying up and down the street. Street I live on. But I'm going to rock on. I'm just going to rock on, going to rock on. I'm not going to go. I'm not going to go. In fact, one time I went to visit that neighbor down the street. Know what he said? Get away from me. You're that crazy Christian from up the road there, what? So I'm going to just keep rocking. Go rock on, rock on. You know what the Lord Jesus Christ is saying? Listen, you put your hands on the plow handle. I saved your soul. I didn't save you to rock and to rock and rock and keep on rocking. I have something for you to do, and you need to do it. What I have for you to do is more important than your family, your mother, your sister, your brothers. What I have for you to do is the most important thing in this world. I'm sure that those Jewish families that heard what he had to say, they probably thought to themselves, oh my, this is really radical. But you know, in another place, Jesus said, let the dead, dead bury the dead. It just, what I really take from all of this is this, my dear friends, is that you've got to put God first in your life. He's got to be number one. You cannot get off the track following your family, following someone else, listen to someone else, listen to the Lord God. That may be you're here tonight and you've never given your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't understand what he's really talking about. But when a sinner trusts the Lord Jesus Christ, he experiences a new birth. He becomes a new creature. He enter enters into the family of God. He shares in the divine nature of God. And when you do that, you can call God your Father. This is not something you accomplish for yourselves. This is not something someone else can do for you. It's God's work of grace. All we can do is just simply... Believe and receive. But here's a kicker, my friends. A lot of people today say, I believe. I've been saved. But you know what? They just keep rocking. Keep right on rocking. They never get out of the rocking chair to do anything. Keep rocking. And then, many times, those are the same people who say to you, well, I wonder why the church is not growing. I wonder why this is not happening. Need to ask yourself that question. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for this time we've had together. How I thank you, Lord God, that Jesus took the time to teach his disciples what was the number one thing
what was the most important thing in their lives. It wasn't their family. It wasn't all these other things that they felt was so important. The most important thing for them and the most important thing for us is to know the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Savior and then be obedient unto him all the days of our life. Father, forgive us where we failed you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.